wholly unnatural for human beings. He's, thought, he's not talking about any kind of love that's defined simply by the human nature, or human mind, all the old philosophers and all those weirdos and most of them perverts in Rome and Greece had written about love and folks like to talk about the Greek words. I don't really care about, there's no Greek word to describe godly love. God uses a word. He gives us a word. We don't have to use, uh, and I, I've heard them all my life, so I, I know agape and phileo and all, I don't have to, eris and all that stuff. I don't have to use any Greek words to define God's love. God gives us a, a word in the English language translated, the word is charity. And, and, and then people want to take and take the word charity out, so that means it's love. It's not that same love. Charity in this context, in this scripture, he's teaching. People say, what is charity? We'll read the chapter. The chapter will tell you what charity is. Uh, charity in this is not talking about giving somebody something because it says here, if you give and you don't have charity, then it profits you nothing. So charity is not giving away things. We're gonna look at what charity is. What, what does it mean? Charity is God's definition of love. It's love as he defines it. It's God's love. Charity is God's love toward man manifested through another person. We as believers manifest the love of God to a lost and dying world. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, what do we call ourselves? Christians then. Christ-like ones. What did Jesus come into this world to do? Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, but what does John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And, and so charity is you and I allowing God to demonstrate his love to a lost and dying world. Charity uh, is also this. It's God working through us and how we love one another as believers. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is one, it's a definition of God's love, and the word is charity. And then two, it's a challenge. What the Apostle Paul is saying here, it's like putting the carrot out. He said, you want to run the race, and the Apostle Paul talks about running the race and fighting a good warfare. He said, if you want to run the race, and you want to obtain the prize, I may as well go, go ahead and tell you what the upper echelon prize is, what the chief prize is. He said, don't run for a lesser prize. Don't look for some lesser thing. He said, follow after charity. He said, that's the, that's the number one thing. And so it's a challenge here. He showed us the upper echelon, the top prize, the grand prize of the Christian life is this word charity. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, let's read uh, the chapter 13 verses together. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Look what he's saying. He said, I have all faith. I don't want to read it over and over again. He said, but if I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm not something. I am nothing, he says. Amen. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods. Here's, here's the world's definition of charity is bestowing our goods. He said, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So charity is not just giving your stuff away. It's not even giving yourself away. It says here, it says, the word charity, it says in verse number four, because in verse three he says, I can bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I can give myself to be burned, and still not have charity. It's right there in the King James English language. Verse number four, charity suffereth long and is kind. That's the first thing that he uses to define charity. Now we're gonna see what charity is. 
It's not hard. Amen. It's not difficult. Listen, let me just say this. You can love anything as far as the world's definition is. You can love your car. You can love your house. You can love your things. You can love your possessions, so to speak. You can love anything, but you can't have charity to those things because God, count, he says, I count all things. The Apostle Paul said, I count all things but laws. I count them but dumb. All right? God's love doesn't love dumb. All right? God's love doesn't love material things. God's love is manifest toward souls, toward people. And so that's what he's talking about here. He said, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Let me just plug this just one minute. Charity is not puffed up, the Bible says. In, it says, uh, verse number five, it doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Listen, this is not just a cute chapter for people getting married. This is for God's people dealing with God's people and God's people dealing with the lost world manifesting to God's people, our brothers and sisters, first of all, and to the lost world, manifesting to them the love of God, which God defines or calls charity. And if we don't have charity, we're nothing. And God's telling us what charity is. It does not behave itself unseemly. It seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Thinketh no evil. You're going to have a hard time doing that if all you do is watch the news. Amen? Because that's all you're going to think about. I'm talking about the news. And, and I even stretch that to the, all the internet stuff and all the websites. You say, well, i got to know all this information. The truth of the matter is you have one life to live and there's a lot of junk I don't need to know. If I know, listen, I, I better watch something. If I'm not careful, if I'm not careful, I'll know so much about everybody else that I have no use for anybody. And listen, if I acted on what knowledge I already have, I'd be so far up the hollow, I'd never come out, amen? But listen, it's, the, the thing is that there are people that need the Lord. They need the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and they need salvation. They need to know the love of God. And so Jesus left heaven and came to this wicked, vile earth and died on the cross for us. The Bible says, thinketh no evil. Do you know Jesus knew everything about me when he went to the cross? And he knew everything about you when he went to the cross? And he knew everything about every single person who would be born on this earth and walk on this planet? He knew all about us, yet he still went to the cross and died for us. He left heaven to come to this earth to suffer and bleed on Calvary for us knowing what we are. The verse says, thinketh no evil. You said I kind of I grew up in a church where if people if, if new people walked in, everybody looked at them funny. And I, if someone hears this, I'm sorry. That's the, that is that it's the truth. It's unfortunate. That's the way the church. That's the way things were. And especially if somebody that wasn't clean or enough walked in, or or some of the kids from around the hollow walked in, or whatever the case is, people would look at them funny. And there was no reason for that. There, listen, there was no reason for it to be that way, except for the fact that the church didn't really comprehend the love of God. They didn't really have a mission. They call themselves missionaries, but they didn't have a mission to reach the lost. They didn't have the love of God that moves men to go down to where sinners are and reach up to them and help bring them up to where God is. That's charity. Charity spans the gap between the weak and the unfortunate and the fallen and the, mis the malcontent. And charity reaches way down to pick us up. You know, for the, uh, Jeremy, your testimony, and I'll go through it all, but I remember at camp when you talked about the old man, Wyoming County, am I right? The old man just walked over. He didn't know you, but he loved you. You know why he loved you? Because God's love was in him. And God moved him to walk over and say that, to reignite that flame, to reignite that fire. Why? That was the love of God manifest in a complete stranger to another stranger. But they wasn't a stranger. It was a divine act of the providence of God. Almighty God's love manifest through some willing vessel. And that's what God wants us to be, is charitable willing vessels. Everybody needs somebody to love them. And the world doesn't know what love is, but you and I as believers, we know what love is. Yeah. 
You know why we know what love is? Because we know he who, him who is love. God is love. You know the world doesn't know anything about love because they've never known the love of God. Until you know God's love, you can't love anybody. Once we know God's love and we never show anybody God's love, then we're of all men most miserable. We're wicked and vile if we never manifest his love. If we say only, let God's love come to me, but never let God's love go through me, then what's wrong with us? How shameful it would be for us to know the love of God and never show the love of God, never spread the word of love of God. That's why we preach the things we preach. That's why we don't care so much about the nonsense of the world, the, pol the politics, the world pits men against men. But Jesus Christ came to this earth to seek and to save that which is lost so that whatever walk of life, wherever a person comes from, so that they can see the Christ of Calvary and see that there is love of God and there is salvation and there is hope. But also the cross shows that there's condemnation. You know what the cross did? It judged all men wicked. It judged all men as vile. It judged all men as filthy. The same blood, the same Savior, the same cross for all men, all nations, all races, all creeds, so that all everybody has to do is look to the cross and be saved. And God puts a banner over that cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever I can hear brother Mullen saying the red the rich the poor the black the white the yellow the, the whatever else he can go over that all the time and I, I miss hearing him say it Amen. I miss him but I'm glad he practiced what he preached and I'm glad he loved people and that's what God needs out of us is for us to love people and not because of what they can do for us, not because of what side of tracks they come from, not that the world needs to see the love of Christ through you and I who are his Christians. That's what we're here for. The Bible says about, e about charity that it thinketh no evil. It's sad that we've come to a place as Christians that the first thing we do we see someone is think evil and then they've got to prove that they're worthy. It's the truth and it's sad. Verse 6 says, Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things. You sure you want the definition of charity? I don't know if I like it or not. Endureth all things. Because the Bible says if I don't have charity, I'm nothing. And this book is telling me what charity is. And it breaks me over the coals. And it breaks every one of us over the coals. Brother, none of us can stand up to, against the standard of true Bible definition of the word charity. But we ought to be challenged to be. You know the Bible, we, when we read the Bible, we're going to the gym. Amen. And we're getting coached. And we're getting told what our flaws are. We're not there to get pat, uh, 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 you know, pat on the back. We're there to be shown where we need to improve and listen through the Holy Spirit we can. It says that charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fall. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Verse number nine says, for we now, for we know in part, but we prophesy in part. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when he which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three in the ring. But the greatest of these is charity. If you want to pursue after the great characteristic of Christianity, you're going to have to get in the ring and tangle with charity. 
You're going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to wrestle with charity. And the truth of the matter is, you're not there to overcome, but to be overcome. And to realize how far we are from what Christ would have us to be because Christ came into this world so that this world would know what charity is. In Christ, this world knew charity, but Jesus left this world and left us here so that you and I can manifest to this world what charity is, Christianity, what the love of God is. I want you to see something tonight. Brother Jeremy preached a couple of weeks ago about the book of Ephesians. If you'll turn to chapter 4, and the first, and he made the statement there, and it's a true statement, the first portion of Ephesians is showing oneness in Christ. How that we're one in him as a body of Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, but we're one in Christ. We see that as we study the book. Look here. First Corinthians, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. With all lowliness and meekness, what is our vocation? Is to demonstrate charity. Every child of God is called, has a vocation, a calling, and that is to be a vessel or a demonstration of charity. Stay with me. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. Sound familiar? Forbearing one another in what? In love. Verse number three. Look at this word. Endeavoring. See that word? That means it's not easy. That means it's a challenge. It's an endeavor. During, uh, when we went to uh, the mountains the other day, we went, we decided, uh, I decided, to, we decided to walk up Seneca Rocks, the, the overview up there. I think it's 2.7 miles. And, and I had, I, on the way over, I suggested I have to, I to make sure we get that map lined up right. And let's, let's go on up there and we'll do that. So we did. And it was a challenge. Even Hannah was getting mad. You know, I mean, I looked at Hannah halfway up, three quarters of the way up, and she was ready to go home. I mean, and I mean, and, and, and we, it was a good run. It was a good workout. And we got on top and and uh, Jess said, well, look, this, the, there's a shortcut, right? But don't ever listen to that kind of stuff. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. I've never, I haven't told this part of the story yet. We, but uh, So we, we wrestled with whether or not to do that. It was, we could have gone back the long way, but we endeavored to go the short way. And that's down the back side of the rock cliff. And so I was carrying uh, uh, Eden, because she had a meltdown, and I was carrying the baby straight down the hill sliding rocks everywhere. Jess behind me, Kurt behind me, kicking the mountain down behind me. Angelia carried John all the way down. Her brothers couldn't even do that. They were too busy whining about the, the, the journey, you know. And down that hill, we got to the bottom and there's signs all over. It says, don't use this without a, uh, without a, a helmet on and repelling gear and all kinds of stuff. Man, we, got, we were glad to get to the bottom of the ground. I'll tell you what, that was an endeavor. That was a challenge. I'm not going to lie to you. My legs carrying the babies down. I couldn't use my arms. My legs were shaking. I mean, just, just like that, and the muscles in my legs, trying to plant my feet, not to fall and plant the baby on its head. I mean, it was a challenge. It was an endeavor. And that's what God says here. It says endeavoring. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, look, you know how many children you have to have to understand this? Two. Oh, you need two. And it'll help. And I don't know if they understood it then. But listen, I don't know what a chariot ride was like, but I know what a car ride's like. Amen? Yeah. Isn't it amazing that whenever you get kids in the car, there's a flip, there's a switch that flips. And the only way to respond to it is the way my mom responded to it. And she would just, just turn around and just start beating people with the back of her hand. I mean, and listen, just start waylaying people. And if she pulled over, God forbid if she had to pull over. I'm going, I remind, I remind my dad say, I'm turning around. I'm going back home. We're not going anywhere. Just as soon as you get in the stupid car, the stupid kids have to start trying to kill each other. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Why? But listen, that's what God is saying here. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. He's saying it's an endeavor. And somebody has to take the challenge. And how are you going to do it? Look what it says. There's one Lord. There's one faith, one baptism. How many times do I say to kids, hey, we're one family. 
We're a team here. Why are we going to fight? Why are we going to be this way? It's a challenge. But you know what? You got to do it in the church too. I've lived now through 20 plus years of independent fundamental Baptist. And you know what? Every, every 10 years at least, you have the same stupid fights. And it's all because we lack Christ-like charity. And somebody in every generation, I remember the first time, somebody has to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Thank God there are Spirit-filled people who will endeavor to do that. Because there are others who come under the influence of Satan who will do all they can to destroy and to divide. And for some reason or another, they desire ungodly attention and they'll tear up more than they help. Not saying those people are altogether lost, but they're immature. They're like children. In 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul challenges us. He says, we're no more children. We're putting away childish things. And then in Ephesians, we're moving on. We're moving on. We're endeavoring, he said. But verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace. According to the measure of the gift of Christ. Let me just say this. That the greatest grace that God gives is charity. You say, how can I have charity? Well, you can't earn it. You can't obtain it. It's a gift. You, but you have to receive it. And we, every single day we need to say, God, I need grace. I need God, give me grace to, to deal with this situation. To behave right. To behave as you would have me to behave. God, give us grace, charity. Look what it says. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Read with me. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. That means us. That means talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit. How do you know if you're filled with the Spirit? And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the what? The edifying of the body of Christ. Why do we try to, why do we not want our children to fight and carry on? Because it doesn't edify anybody. Why do we try to, in our marriages, why do we try to encourage each other? Well, you know what, you're just, you're just like, you know, don't do that. Don't even, you know, when you start that nonsense. Edify one another. Encourage. Why? That's what the Lord said for us to do here. Look what he said. Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. That's a Bible word, not my word. I didn't make, create the word Unity. Not unity with unbelievers of different faiths, but unities in the faith. I'm not concerned tonight with Christians linking up with unbelievers. That, that shouldn't happen. We're not to be unequally. I'm to, concerned, though, with the opposite, is that Christians can't have unity among one another. And that's sad. He said, and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. When I was a child, I spake as a child. You know what a child is? He's immature. But now we're talking about becoming a mature, perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, being the image of Christ, the goal of Christianity, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking what the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ now understand this that when the bible says speak the truth in love that doesn't mean that if we say everything in a loving caring way no one will ever get offended because you can speak the truth in love and people still get angry. Amen. It's just the truth. Amen? People don't get mad most of the time at how we say it. They get mad at what we say. And they use how we say it as an excuse to disregard what we say. The Bible says here, it goes on. Verse number 16. You'll see why we're reading this chapter in a minute. 
from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. According to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Meaning this, that we build up the body of Christ. When we build up one another, when we edify one another, we build up the body of Christ. When we have unity, we build up the body of Christ. When we demonstrate charity, we build up the body of Christ. But when we don't do those things, the opposite of edify is tear down. In this day and time, the greatest need of the world in the year 2020 is the body of Christ to demonstrate Christ-like charity to each other, to one another, and to the lost. As this world grows further and further in sin, hatred, wickedness, evil, division, strife will increase. The only way this world, as it gets darker and darker and further and further from Calvary, the only way this world will see the truth of God's love and heavenly charity is if they see it up through us afresh. As fresh as the essence of the cross. You know how they'll see that? Is if we walk with God and we live daily under the banner, under the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. Unless the love that compelled Christ to Calvary is manifest in us, then the world will not see that love. We're to speak the truth. We're to go and to win folks and to witness to them. But here's the, tr here's the problem. If we don't demonstrate love one to another, then when we go out to demonstrate love to the world, you know what we are? We're hypocrites. And the world will see that. If we can't love the body of Christ and love one another, you preacher, we don't have that problem here. Right? We don't. We don't have an issue here. I'm not preaching to fix something here. I'm preaching, one, I rejoice in the fact that we do have a godly uh, church here that edifies folks and builds up people. But I want you to understand how important that is. Amen. And it's not just so we can love one another, but it's so that the world can see the love of God. Folks need to be around this. They need to see this. Our loved ones, are. Uh, they need to hear the truth of the gospel. They need to realize there's a hell. They need to hear the gospel. And come to the house of God and grow. Instead of all the other nonsense, we need to be getting people to Christ. We need to get, be getting people under the influence of a good, godly church. That ought to be our burden. That ought to be our desire. To get people to Christ, to get people to Calvary, to show them the gospel, to get them in the church house, to get them under the preaching of the word of God. Nothing has changed in 2020. Oh, I, I know there's a lot of avenues. And boy, I like to preach about them. And there's a lot of things I can talk about. And it's an election year. And we can entangle ourselves in a lot of things. But nothing has changed since Christ went to Calvary. The world still needs to hear about the love of God. And they need to see it. And they see it in us. I'll explain that to you if you'll stay with me. He said this in verse number 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17. That ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. In the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God. Through the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling. Have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. To work all uncleanness with greediness. But notice this, you have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that look what he says, you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Look what he says, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true Holiness. See that word, true holiness? Remember that phrase, remember that word, those words, true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members. Here we go. One of another. You know the greatest lie you can tell is the lie to yourself. If you lie to yourself, you're, you're, you're in bad shape. 
you know what? God said we're members one of another. If we lie to each other, we're lying to ourselves. Look what he said. He said, verse 26, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Not begrudgingly, but lovingly. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God will write your seal unto the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Here's how you grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness... You bitter against anybody? Amen. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, all ill intent. You say, I'm going to put it away, but I'm going to find a way to get even with them. That's malice. Yep. I, I, I won't hate them, but I still hate them. I got my fingers crossed, God. I'm gonna hate him with my I'm gonna hate him and you won't know it. Now that God still knows it. Now look how this chapter there's a reason why I read this whole chapter. It culminates with verse 32. Look what verse 32 says. The capstone of the chapter. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. It means that we're to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, even as. That word as, that as is what? It's an assembly, right? Even as. It means that we're to do it the same way God does it. How can God forgive men? Through Christ. How can we forgive men? How can we be a blessing? Through Christ. That's the only way. It's through Christ. Now follow me. We're going somewhere. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. Colossians 1 24 says, Who now rejoice in my suffering for you, to fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the what? The church. Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now don't get dumb here. What does the word dispensation mean? It means the pouring out of something or pouring in. So Paul says God put something in me. He poured something out to me for you. Now, you explain to me for a minute, how did Paul go from absolutely hating all Christians and wanting them all dead to laboring night and day for Christians? You know what that was? It was a dispensation, a pouring out from God in Paul. Paul went from hating Christians to literally loving them so much that he was willing to suffer and be beaten in some ways more even than what Jesus was. His own people. Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. I'm not trying to make an ungodly comparison, but I'm just saying that Jesus was crucified once. Paul was beaten many, many times by the Jews. One time the whole city came down on him and tried to kill him. And when the Roman centurions rescued him and carried him up the steps, he said, can I say a word to these people? And he turned around and he preached to them. How could that happen? A dispensation from God, a pouring out from God of what? Of love, grace, the gift of grace, the gift of charity, love. Look what he says. 
Verse 26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Look what it says. To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, you know what? If Christ is in us, you know what's going to be manifest through us? His love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What is Christ? He's the picture. He's the manifestation to the lost and dying world of God's love. If Christ be in you, the hope of glory. Look what it says, verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Where unto I also labor striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. You think it was easy for Paul to not ever get bitter? You know why Paul never get, didn't get bitter against the, his enemies? You know why he kept preaching to them? You know why he said, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness have gone about to establish their own righteousness. Why did Paul weep and wish that himself were a curse for his kinsmen? Why? Because the love of God was manifest in his life. You know what all it would take to change our world today is for the love of God to be manifest in us like it was in Paul. One man. And there are Christians all over the place today, myself included, and I don't know if all of us together demonstrate such love as what Paul did, one man. But we sure should, shouldn't we? We ought to, shouldn't we? That ought to be our desire. That ought to be our goal. That ought to be the longing of our heart to demonstrate such love. Now we're winding down to the end. If that makes you feel good. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 14. I never apologize for scripture for using too much. I apologize sometimes for using too little. But, but all these scriptures run together. and You're going to see that in just a minute. Romans chapter 14. Sometimes I'm amazed, and I know the Bible's all one book, and I know it all runs together, but I'm amazed at how well it runs together sometimes. It just amazes me. Amen. Happy birthday to Marvin. Glad to have your mama with us. A dear friend of mine. Always one of my highlights of the year. Amen. Love you folks. Glad you're here. Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Now look at this. Now we're going to move on here to some big stuff. Now pay attention. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Now don't take that out of context. It's not talking about not having proper judgment. But he's saying this. Now that we've come to the conclusion that we're all sinners. Let's not try to figure out who's the best sinner and who's the worst sinner. Romans chapter 14 in Romans, the book of Romans, the apostle Paul has dealt with the Jew and the Gentile. And he's shown both, that they're both sinners. And he's saying to them, it's time to stop judging who's the worst and who's the best. It's time to start saying he's a Jew, he's a Gentile. It's time to start being the body of Christ. We're going to have unity in the body of Christ. We're going to have to love one another. No man ever yet hated his own self. If he does, something's wrong with him. Look what it says. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that what no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Look at the next verse. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. Paul said, did you see what he said? There's nothing unclean of itself. But... My brother might esteem something to be unclean, and you know what? To him, it's unclean. And Paul said, I don't want to be a stumbling block to him. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not, what's the word? Charitably. 
He said, if your brother is grieved by your course of action and your liberty, then you're not walking charitably toward him. Look what he says. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. I was listening to a sermon by J. Vernon McGee. If y'all ever listen to J. Vernon McGee, he's calm, sedated, and uh, man, just, just southern charm. But man, I had never heard him get fired up before. But if he got fired up in this sermon, and he called somebody out, it was in the evening service, and I suppose in the morning service he'd gotten a letter. A, a, a law, unsaved couple had visited the church, and their daughter was there. She was not dressed as she should have been. And on the way out to the car, one of the attendees of the church, an older man, just berated the girl, just jumped all over her, just called her name, jumped all over her. They wrote J. Vernon McGee a mess, a note about it. And brother, you should have heard. I mean, I mean, he berated that fellow. I mean, he called him, he all but called him out. He, he said, if I knew who you were, I'd tell you this to your face, but I don't know you, so I'm telling you in front of everybody, just in case. He, and, and he went on to preach for 10 or 15 minutes. And at that time, in this sermon, he's talking about our nation back in the 60s and under and, and uh, under Kennedy as a president, he's talking about rebellion in the street and revolting bl blood being shed. He said in that sermon, he said, 15 years ago, I said that blood would flow in the streets of America. That was in 1955, probably. He said, a couple came to me during the service and rebuked me and said, that's hyperbole, that'll never happen. He said, the only problem that I have with my statement is I didn't affirm it strong enough. He said, I kind of took their rebuke and kind of backed up a little bit. That was the 1960s. He was talking about the National Guard being called up to help the police in certain areas because of the revolts. We forget this stuff. But in that sermon, he said, the only thing, the only hope for this nation is the love of God manifest in the believers, in God's people. That's it. it's still the only hope. It's still the only hope. I know we're stirred up, and I know we want to we want to follow after. We think we can do this and that. We can think that we can jump on this wagon or that wagon. But the only thing that's going to reach this world is the love of Christ manifest in His people and you and I. That's it. And if we don't get our if we don't get our hearts right again, as that church in Ephesus did everything right, but they left their first love. And I think maybe that verse relates to what we're talking about tonight. We're more interested in dotting our I's and crossing our T's and calling out this group and calling out that group and judging this group and judging that group. And I'm not against, there are some things that need to be judged, but I'm just saying we've forgotten the great thing. We've forgotten to judge ourselves and see if we're behaving right as members of the body of Christ. Let me continue the verse. For the kingdom of God, verse 17, is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Turn to one other place. Turn to Hebrews. Chapter number 12. All the scripture runs together. I just want you to see all the scripture tonight. And it's just now 8 o'clock, so we're doing well. Hebrews 12, 3 says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. That ought to help us preachers especially. Boy, I can't believe somebody put a thumbs down on my sermon. I saw one this week, and boy, I, I, I felt like someone punched me. I wanted to go find out who it was. That's your flesh, dummy. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean a thing. Don't be caught up with stupidity like that. It don't matter. You Listen, the world's not going to like our, our message. The world's not going to like everything we say, but we love. Listen, they, they, they beat Paul. And he still loved them. They hung Jesus on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. They took stones and stoned Stephen. And Stephen said, Lord, lay not this to their charge. 
We don't, even, we don't even know what Christianity is anymore. Look what he said. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father's spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his, what? Holiness. What do we say about holiness? Remember that word earlier about holiness? Well, I'll follow this. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Why does the Lord chasten us? But grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth. Here's what chastening results in. The peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, now notice this, verse 12. Here's the result of chastening. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down. And the feeble knees. We're going to be. We're going to have a desire to lift the fallen, to encourage the feeble. Someone that's feeble that is they can't run as fast, and, and they're, they're they're weak, and, and they're not growing. Listen, one of the first things that you'll see when a church is going downhill is a pharisaical attitude toward the feeble. Oh, we don't want that kind around here. But the truth of the matter is, we all want that kind so that we can love them and preach to them and pray for them and encourage them and God give them strength through us as we edify and build them up. You know, I feel bad. When I look around, I don't see as many feeble people as I'd like to see. I like to see feeble saints. You say, oh, I'm, I'm not talking about physically. I mean, I'm not talking about mentally. I know we got those St. Bases covered. I'm talking about spiritually feeble. So, boy, we want to have a holy, righteous church. You better have some feeble people in there. Amen? If you don't have them, you go find them. And bring them to the house of God. And love them and encourage them and strengthen them. Amen. I love to be in a service and have me about a handful of good feeble folks. Amen. It'll, it'll help your preaching more than anything else. They that are whole have no need of a physician. Amen. You want folks there to say, boy, I need this. I need that. I need that. I need to hear that. That helps me. I worry about those folks that sit back there and wait to tell me how much Bible they know. And just stay home and study. As a matter of fact, they'll tell you that. And then do it. Amen? Look what the Bible says. Look at this. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, the feeble knees, and make straight paths. Look at this. Make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Meaning this, keep it simple, make a straight path. Why? So that you can help the lame to be healed. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and what? Holiness. Where does holiness? Look what the next verse, the clause says. Without which no man shall see the Lord. Now here's a verse a lot of folks stumble over. Say, well, you won't, hey, you're not going to get to heaven without holiness. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. Follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. What are people supposed to see in us? They're supposed to see the Lord. What is holiness? The manifestation of holiness. The height of holiness is the word charity, is godly love. Christ-like love manifests in us. 
The Bible says mark the perfect man. You know what, how you mark the perfect man? He's able to do something. He's able to bridle his tongue. Christianity today needs a good old-fashioned dose of godly charity. That's why he's talking about chastening here, to get them to the place where they care about folks. Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many, thereby many be defiled. Now he uses an illustration here that I think is important. Look what it says. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, I'm not trying to let Esau off the hook here. But do you know Esau's problems came about because of Jacob's scheming? Jacob's ungodly, unlawful act brought about Esau's fall. You know, I kind of like Esau, honestly. I kind of respect Esau because later on Jacob saw him and wrestled all night and thought, my brother's going to kill me. You know what Esau did when he saw his brother? He hugged him. You know, I don't think it had to turn out the way it did for Esau. I really don't. God would have worked that situation out and, and Esau would have handled it. But so often as Christians, we behave in the wrong way. And I think the product is an Esau. Bitterness, someone who turns away. How many bitter people have I heard reject the, reject the word of God and never get saved? Because of, well, if he's a Christian, if they're a Christian, if that's what Christianity is, then I'll never be sad. You don't have to turn to it because I already told you. I wouldn't ask you to turn anywhere else, but... If you want to read something that's really brings this whole truth home, John 13 says this, verse 31. Therefore, when he was going out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him, Christ in you, the hope of glory. For if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, Yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me. And as I said to the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you. Verse 34 of John 13. That you what? Love one another. As, there's that simile again. As I have loved you, that ye also, there's the command again, twofold, twice driven home that you also love one another. Look at verse 35, if you're open there. By this, without holiness shall no man see the Lord. By this shall who? How many? All men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one to another. Now I ask anyone anywhere to argue with that context of scripture and there is no argument against it herein tonight this truth is the truth that you and I as Christians need to hear and apply and we need to demonstrate to the world first of all to one another charity and then to the world charity you know people ought to want to come to church because when they get to church they feel and they are aware of the love of God. They ought to sense it in the parking lot. They ought to know it. They ought to sense it when they walk in the doors. And if we fail in that area, we ought to go to people and say, look, I was wrong. I, I was wrong. I, I'm weak. I'm faulty. Help me. There ought to be no division in the body of Christ. You know what? And if the results of that, the fruit of that is that we are able to demonstrate to others and see others, you know what? We edify, we build up the body of Christ. And that's how we build up the body of Christ. We demonstrate God's love to one another. And we demonstrate the love of Christ, the love of Calvary to a lost and dying world. Amen?
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for your word. Thank you, dear Lord God, for the truth of it. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight, Lord, to take to heart this message, God. And it's not really that hard, Lord. It's, it's not something we try to produce, Lord. It's there. The love of God is available. It's a, gra it's a grace, a gift of grace. God, it's not something that humanly we can generate, not something that we can produce. Lord, we just, I believe, need to make room for it. Get the other stuff out, Lord, the worldly stuff out. Lord, get all that out and just make room, dear God, for your dispensation of grace and love into our lives. God, help us to do that through your Holy Spirit, through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand tonight and